man, this is Deion Dawkins, man. You're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already know. Welcome back, everybody, to The Scoop, OwlScoop.com's podcast. We are on to episode 16 of season 10. I'm OwlScoop.com editor John DiCarlo, and we've got a full house today. Assistant editor Kyle Gauss is with us, along with Declan Landis and Johnny Zawizlag. Guys, we've got a ton of stuff to get into in this episode. Adam Fisher's Temple men's basketball program is now off to a 3-0 start after beating Drexel Tuesday night. In the Owls' first Big 5 game, Diane Richardson's Owls are now 1-1 one one after holding off Delaware on the road Tuesday night down in uh, sort of Declan's neck of the woods. Uh, Cam Wallace of the Westtown School and Cam Miles at IMG Academy have signed their national letters of intent today as part of Adam Fisher's 2025 class. You'll hear from them on the pod later, and uh, you'll hear from assistant coach Bobby Jordan, who had a hand in recruiting both of them. And you'll also hear from Stan Drayton, who really, really opened up a lot on Monday about why he feels Temple needs to level up on its NIL efforts. And of course, we'll get to all of your mailbag questions as well, because we've got a ton of them. I uh, want to give a little bit of a shout out to the Bryn Mawr field hockey team. Uh, my wife, Chelsea, works at Bryn Mawr. They are also known as the Owls. They have advanced to their first NCAA tournament and they won their first NCAA tournament game today and uh, first appearance in the program's history. They beat SUNY Geneseo, I believe, is the school. So yes. congratulations to uh, to the Owls of Bryn Mawr. And, uh, and their quest for a Division three, I believe, National Field Hockey Championship Good for them. Told, Electric. Uh, Electric. Told awesome. Child that I would give them a shout out on the pod. The Scoop, as always, is brought to you by Greenspan and Greenspan Injury Lawyers. If you've been injured while on the road or the highway and the crash was someone else's fault, the insurance company is not going to be on your side. You need us. Temple Law grads will fight hard to get the compensation that you deserve. We only get paid if we win. So in Pennsylvania or New York... Call us today, 215-261-7359. That's 215-261-7359. And you can find them on the web at greenspans-law.com. That's greenspans-law.com. Declan, what do you have cooked up for on or around this date? Oh, okay. All right. No intro banter. Just going into it. We might as well. Uh, well, let's, I mean, well, what do, what do you want to talk about? I got nothing. All right, so we're looking at uh, November fourteenth. Is that the day this episode comes out? And uh, and Kyle, I'll go to you. Kyle, what do you uh, what do you want to start with today? What the hell? I think if I have my druthers, I'd like to start with birthdays. Okay, hey, if you if you say so, Johnny's stop upset. being offended. I ask Johnny's you every upset. week. Yeah, that I thought that was the thing. Well, can I, I don't, just ask? You know, you? whatever. I, yeah, it's, I, it's your it's your segment. You do your thing. Can we just eat Drama our dinner queen. and and not have family strife? Can you pass Drama. my Yeah, yeah I wish. On this day in 1840, this French painter was born, known for his impressionist work. A little, a lot of nature scapes had a cool bridge painting, I believe. Uh, I can't think of a single other thing about him. My fourth grade Monet? teacher would be devastated. Yes, Claude Monet. Well done. Oh, nice. Well done. On this wait, day in 19... Wait, sorry. Is Monet the one where they're all like by the, the pond and like they're holding the umbrellas? And I think so. Maybe I am, to be honest, oh, not hey. quite familiar with that work. I know he did a lot of nature paintings, though. So, uh, you know, it could be, could be. Next week, we are recording from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. That'd be awesome. Yeah, On this day cool. in 1908. Run, I want John to run the steps, though, to get up there. You did that this weekend, right? You did. So I didn't want to talk steps. about that. I, I did the Rocky run and run. Let's use that term loosely. I did more walking than uh, than running, but it was fun. A ton of people there. There you Excellent. go. A lot of good Rocky music, soundtrack music played. What was and the they, distance? Well, you could do you could do a 5K and then you could do a 10 miler. So former Al Scoop assistant editor Mike Mudrick did it with our friend John Lamb. They're like they're serious runners. Brandon Lausch, good uh, temple person, friend of mine, Chris Vito. They're solid runners. Uh, but Chell and I did it. My stepbrother-in-law, Hal, and his wife, Jess. Um who else was on our team? Chelsea's cousin Lisa. Um, it was it was fun. A lot of uh, I mean, they explored the whole Rocky catalog and playing music. There you they go. Stuff from Rocky Four. Rocky. Did they dip into Creed. I don't believe they did. Mm, no. Interesting. The band was it Frank Nord Stallone. Did. Take it back. I I don't know. I know Frank Stallone did a song. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Can you sing that song? That no, time? I cannot. Hey, On this day in 1908, this United States senator was born, known for his tie up. Well, I guess, you know, alleged ties to the uh, to communism during, you know, the peak or the, the peak of tensions with Russia. We're starting the peak. I don't think it was the peak. McCarthy. But... Yes, Joseph McCarthy. Well, wait, no. wait, 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 wait. Wow. McCarthy wasn't tied to communism. He was no, he was allegedly. People. They they, no, they accused he, him no. of. No, 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 no. no. He, he was, was the accuser. People of he would, being communist. Yeah, he, he would put him oh, on I the red list. Way around. Yeah, no, 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 no. He was accusing people. That's what. That's on me. From. That that's yeah. you know that's I apologize. Didn't read the Wikipedia enough. On this day in 1954, this American... Did we get a do-over question? I mean, I got it, but I feel like if you had asked it accurately... I would have gotten it. Gotten if you had yeah. given like, actual info instead of the make-believe info, I would have gotten it. All right, well, how about you get this next one? You know, John, <laughs> John's up 2 nothing right real now. real tense And that hasn't right happened now. yet. You know, that's that's hmm. pretty uh, pretty rare. Everybody needs a glass of wine. Let's just relax. Uh, I wish. <laughs> On this day in 1954, this American government official was born. She served as national Secret uh, security advisor excuse me and secretary of state to u.s president george w bush condoleezza rice yes. condoleezza rice there you go we are going to move out of birthdays now yeah, on this one. day in 1851 harper and brothers published herman melville's masterpiece blank <laughs> yeah i'm trying to get you to guess it herman melville Maybe. one of the greatest works in literary <laughs> history What's the synopsis of the book? Whale. Oh. Moby Dick. Yeah, Moby Dick. <laughs> I'm Real quick, not... uh, every week my daycare sends home a newsletter, and this week they sent a newsletter about like what some of the kids are working on, and they referred to something as uh, your kid's magnus opus. The the most significant work of my kid's Already? life is happening at four years old. <laughs> <laughs> Already? Sure. Is this for, this is for Haley or Jordan? This is for Jordan. Oh, God, no. Haley... Haley would bully somebody else into writing it for her. Jordan. <laughs> oh my God. Jordan is doing it. That's insane. On this day in 1889, American journalist Nellie Bly began her around the world race against the record of Phileas Fogg, hero of June Verne's Blank. Around uh, the world. Favorite, favorite, yeah, famous novel. She completed the journey in slightly more than 72 days. Good movie, too. Oh, I used to watch that. It's a good on video this... game called 80 Days where you have to try to replicate it. It's a nice little text-based video game. Oh, I, I didn't know that was a game. That sounds yeah, pretty well, good. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a good game. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure. I do love a good choose-your-own-adventure. Yeah. On this day in 1915, educator, reformer, and first president and principal developer of the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, now Tuskegee University, passed away at the age of 59. The reason the a founder lot of passed away. Scenes. Okay. Um, yeah, founder passed away. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know his name. Booker T. Washington. Oh. oh. Uh, on this day in 1969, this famous space mission was launched carrying a crew of Charles Conrad Jr., Richard F. Gordon Jr., and Alan L. Bean. And five days later, the mission made the second landing on the moon. Apollo. Oh. Apollo. 12. 12. Yeah. Johnny. Oh, look at Johnny. Johnny from the Johnny. back row. Oh. Blows it out strong because that was on this day. Wow. Yes, I got one. Yeah. Not a boy. That was good. What would your song be coming out of the bullpen? Kesha's <laughs> Timber. Imagine just the lights go out. You hear it's going down. Pitbull comes out. People get excited. That's I feel like I feel like everyone. I know. I know you hate. Pitbull. I know you hate Pitbull, but I feel like Pitbull. Timber is a like bop. Sing along to. It Timber is a bop. bop. Everyone I, would know Timber. Yeah, 100%. he appears to be a, a super nice, very philanthropic guy, and I love him for that. I just, I'm just not really into his music. So you know, he got uh, uh, whatever. Like Kyle's just gonna lean in and be like, you know what, John? A lot of people. You know, he got sued by Lindsay Lohan. Pitbull. Really? <laughs> because in Why? one of his songs, Pitbull says, um, "I'm I'm locked up like Lindsay Lohan," and she never was arrested. Oh, that's true. Like, like she was never incarcerated. Give me everything is the yeah, song. Yeah. Featuring so he know. like she he faced uh, litigation from Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i can separate the art, art from, from the, the artist, artist. Yeah. so you know whatever you've been doing that a lot lately. Sleep at night. i mean obviously i mean i feel like that's a you know yeah. there are there are worse things there are yeah. more artists that do worse things that are still popular yes agreed johnny's not six years old he's able to like these people don't have to be his heroes they don't yeah have to be his i've never i never said pitbull was my like mentor yeah. like mr 305 
He's your mentor. You see what's you see what's happening here. You're continuing to lose, Kyle. Look, I you know no, I I very legitimately agree with that like sentiment of like I don't really care what I know musicians do because like they're not my role models. I just want the product. I'm just trying to cause. I'm just trying to cause uh, some strife between between you and Johnny and Zach. I only have a month left. You were Johnny. You were, yeah. What famous power forward said, "I am not a role model." Oh God! Not a chance. I thought we. I thought we were done with the yeah. trivia. I he threw we, a guy was, through a glass window before, after he, he wore, or before he, he said number, this. He wore number thirty-four. The round mound of rebound. No, nah, he still is not going to get it. No, he's, like, he's on TV. He's on TNT. Shaq. Oh, Charles Barkley. Charles yeah, Barkley. Yeah, Charles Barkley. Yeah, Charles. I, I corrected you. Famous Javon power forward you. Shaquille O'Neal. Javon would kill you. I corrected myself. Mom will put his foot up here. You know what? Yeah, size fourteen shoe. Yeah. Probably. That's okay, though. I don't really watch basketball other than college oh basketball. My God. Other than Charles college Barkley, basketball. Literally a good segue. I said other segue than college basketball. I don't, I, don't watch out the NBA. <laughs> I don't watch the NBA. But I do watch Temple basketball. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> What a great segue. What a great segue. Yeah. How about that segue? Temple beat Drexel 69-61 to Tuesday night at the Leo Core Center to improve to... 3-0, and Zion Stanford scored 19 of his career-high 23 points in the first half and then assisted on Temple's only field goal in the last five minutes of the game to help Temple hold off what was really a, a pretty persistent and tough Drexel team. Uh, Jamal Mashburn Jr. went 2-9 of nine in the first half but still finished with 20 points, went 9-10 of 10 from the foul line, including 4 from the line in the last 90 seconds to ice the game. Kyle, you had an interesting stat on Jamal Mashburn last night. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats, man. That's all awesome. right. Yeah, thanks. Good Appreciate that. Would you, that. Like to share it with out, Would you like to share it with our listeners? <laughs> oh, what did I tweet? No, 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 no. I got this. I got this. So, like, obviously not the best shooting uh, performance of his career, especially in the first half. But, like, Jamal Mashburn did something that has only happened four times in the last 25 years from Temple players, which is at at least 20 points five rebounds, four assists, a steal, and zero turnovers. So even when it's like an off game, Jamal Mashburn still finds a way to be extremely productive so far. Like the only other people to do this are some names you're going to remember, like Marty Collins, Shiz Alston, Jeremiah Williams, like really good players at Temple have done that. Really good players at Temple have not done that. So that was an impressive performance even when his shot wasn't falling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Temple played with just nine scholarship players Tuesday night. Elijah Gray is still in concussion protocol. Adam Fisher said he's hoping to get him back for Friday. Up at Boston College, Shane Dezoni was dealing with a foot injury. Uh, Muhammad Keita, a finger injury from Monday's practice. They still have six more games left to play without Lynn Greer III due to his NCAA uh, rules violations. So, so they're playing with nine guys last night, uh, nine scholarship players. Now, Drexel, meanwhile, had lost more than 80% of its scoring from last season. And on top of that, they lost uh, Garfield Turner, who was, you know, maybe not going to be the player that Amari Williams was after Amari Williams left for Kentucky in the portal. But they're playing a little shorthanded, too. But turned over that roster and put together a team that that really, you know, kind of stuck with Temple most of the way. Kobe McGee had 17 points. Cole Hargrove had 15 points. Uh, you made Butler had 13 points and uh, I was talking to our friend Ari Rosenfeld of elite high school scouting at the game last night. And I was talking about how a guy like Kobe McGee is an example of what we always talk about. And the players are allowed to get better. Westchester at one point didn't even really have much interest in him, thought they could do better, but he was one of their better Damian players. Blair. Damian night. Blair, apparently not the best evaluator of talent. Well, maybe he should. My have former gym that. teacher. Yeah. Maybe you should have learned more downtown high school. Um, Maybe he didn't hang a slider over the plate and I ripped it. <laughs> right. you've, told, you've told that story before. I forgot about that. Um, rebounding, uh, a point of concern again for Temple. They got out rebounded 43 to 38 last night. Uh, and then Drexel got 17 offensive boards. Monmouth got 15 offensive rebounds on them uh, on Friday night up in Trenton. And Sacred Heart also got 15 offensive rebounds against them in the opener. So, not a great trend early on. Uh, Elijah Gray could help there, and not having Shane Dezoni, you know, against Drexel, you know, one of your better rebounding guards. Uh, so a- an issue there. Uh, but beyond that, guy, 69-61 win. Temple's three and zero. They're again, they're doing this without Lynn Greer, doing out, doing it without Elijah Gray last night. They did it without Mokita and Shane Dezoni as well. What do you, what do you guys make of this team? 
so far heading into Friday's game against Boston College up there, which is a very winnable game for him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing for me, and I know this is kind of low-hanging fruit, but just the depth that this team has. I mean, Fisher has said since the season started that he feels like anyone on this roster can go out and get 20 points. I mean, we saw that last night with Zion where he was hot right from the get-go and just kind of carried them through their early offensive struggles. We mentioned Jabal Mashford not really being able to shoot well, Shane Dazoni being out. Um, you know, I, I, Quante Berry had a rough start too with a couple turnovers. So, I mean, I think overall, like there, when the rest of the team hasn't been able to get going early, someone stepped up earlier in the season. It was Jamal Mashburn last night. It was Zion. It feels like someone is always ready on this roster to step up. And then my other thing too, that I, that I wanted to say is, I mean, I feel like the forwards of Baba Tunde Duradola and Steve Settle and in, in the absence of Mo, uh, Mama Okita and, um, I completely and um completely lost my and then Elijah Gray. Sorry, yeah. completely lost my train of thought. But okay. um, I feel like those, those <laughs> I feel like those two had um stepped up really well last night. Papa Tonda Duradola has looked amazing to start this season. So I feel like uh, the four position was kind of something I was questioning going into the season, but it feels like they're relatively deep there. Real quick, I'll add this too. I think he looks really confident. I think there was that one possession. It might have been. Might have been in the second half. They went to him and he, and he tried to drive the baseline. I think he wanted to try to get something going and he, and he, he lost the ball, but he looks awfully confident for a guy who reclassified from 2025 to 2024, missed the majority of their summer workouts. You got to remember like, that guy comes in in like mid to late August. Yeah. And you know, we'd hear kind of just remarks here and there, like, you know, he looks good. He looks good. He looks good. And I don't think they're taking him out of the starting lineup anytime soon. Mm-hmm. I don't know that even if they had thoughts of doing that with Elijah Gray, if he plays Friday, I think they might more, like integrate him more into the lineup, but I think they're really pleased with what they've seen. Absolutely. Uh, Bob and yeah, I, I would be, I think we'd be remiss if we don't talk about Steve Settle a little bit, even yeah. in that game when he only has what, four points this year, they are plus 48 with Steve Settle on the floor and zero without him. Yeah. They are just, like going to like one for one for every minute that they're not that he's not on the floor, they're just scoring the same as Mount they're letting up. He's been very good defensively. He's been their most consistent rebounder. He's playing a little more offensively, like away from the basket than he has in the past, but yeah. ha- has had a very good start to his season. Um, I think it's also kind of it's strange to compare it to last year because so much roster turnover, so much has changed in the last nine games. But they've won eight of nine games going back to last year. now. Like the mm-hmm. only game they've lost in the last nine games was the conference championship game against yeah. UAB. And that's not very common in Temple, in recent Temple history. It hasn't happened since the 2015 season. So you're going back almost 10 years for them to have won eight of nine. They're playing pretty good basketball, even though last night against Drexel was probably the type of matchup that does give you concern, especially without, um, without an Elijah Gray and a Mokita. Is like when you have a true bulky big man like Drexel did. There are moments where you're like, okay, like Baba Tunde is still a freshman. When they have to put Dylan Petit in there, Dylan Petit is still a very skinny freshman to go up against some of these bigger guys. So that's a little bit of a point of concern. You hope that Keita coming back and Elijah Gray, who's a little bulkier at 235, that they'd be able to bang a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a bit of a, a concern and something to watch. Because like, it doesn't seem like they're going to play Villanova, but if they played Villanova, Eric Dixon would probably have a pretty significant game against them. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And you'd have to double, like, you'd have to do all sorts of stuff. I mean, Hargrove, a lot of those 15 points were really easy, like, post-move, you know, yeah. one spin and body, and, and he was into the, you know, right up. They, the also, they the just rim. did a good, he, he does a good job of moving without the ball, and they did a good job of getting the ball to him when, when like, when he, yeah. there was a couple times when Temple's entire defensive philosophy was let them shoot threes. And there were times that, or, and there was times that they, I'm sorry, let them shoot twos. They were closing out on threes. They didn't want to let that happen. When they closed down threes, he had, he did good of finding an open space, and then they did a good job actually getting them there. Yeah, yeah, and Untouched. I think that's that was my biggest takeaway too, just the defensive end because there were times in that first half where they were struggling to communicate. Drexel was getting open those kind of open shots and and generating offense. And granted, they weren't hitting a lot of their shots. Um, I mean, their uh, Spiker said it in the press conference. It was just kind of like. 
we liked that we got that many opportunities. It was just a bad night in terms of actually hitting them. Um, but the second half, it just seemed like they were doing better at communicating on the defensive end. They were closing out on shots better. Um, there, there was less confusion. There was less, you know, there were a couple times in that first half where Zion kind of threw up his hands in frustration with the looks that the the defense was getting. And you didn't see any of that in the second half, particularly in that back half um, of the game, that last five minutes where they couldn't generate any offense. I mean, they didn't have a field goal in the last three and a half minutes and um, still won the game. And Drexel had plenty of opportunities to to take advantage and couldn't. So um, I think you feel good about the defensive end, the offense. You know, you feel good that I mean, I looked down at the scorebook and it, I was shocked. I, I told you I was shocked yeah. that Jamal had 20 points. Like it just didn't feel like it. Um, mm-hmm. So it's nice to have that, you know, quality of a player. Um, I, I do. I think this is a this is a good like feel confident in your program win, especially going up like we're about to talk about and, and playing a team like Boston College in a tough conference like the ACC. Oh, speaking of, you know, big men, they're, they're going up against the guy Friday night and Chad Venning. He's only one of against early for Boston College, only one of two players averaging double figure scoring. He started off his career at Morgan State, played two seasons at St. Bonaventure. He's been pretty good. So far, he could be an issue in the paint for guys like Tunde, like Steve Settle, like Dylan Petit, and maybe Mokita. They get him back. So if Temple can win at Boston College in Chestnut Hill on Friday night, it'll mark the program's first 4-0 start since that 2019-2020 season. So yeah, BC's 1-1. One one. They beat the Citadel in their opener, and then they got blown out by BCU Friday, last Friday in the Veterans Classic. So if you care about preseason polls, BC was picked to finish dead last in the ACC preseason poll. Earl Grant's in his fourth season up there. They lost to UNLV in the second round of the NIT last year. They were pretty good, but they've lost six of their seven top scores from last season, including uh, Quentin Post, who I think was a, a second round draft pick in the NBA draft. So Donald Hand is is the guard that you have to watch out for, former four-star top 150 recruit. So on paper, a game that Temple maybe could and should win, but you're playing it up at their place Friday night. So we will have coverage of that game for you. So stay tuned to us there for Friday night's game. Uh, the Temple women's basketball team, again, evened out their record at 1-1 one one with a 67-56 win at Delaware Tuesday night over a Blue Hens team that's now 0-3. Uh, Anissa Rivera, the Towson transfer, took last season off. Uh, it's continued to play well and... Uh, has season high 11 points and three steals. Tariana Gary had uh, team high 17 points, hit three three pointers. Tristan Taylor had 10 points, seven assists. Uh, their performances were a plus on a night when uh, TR East shot just three of 13 and had nine points. Did not see that game with my own eyes. I imagine that maybe University of Delaware probably just threw a lot of their defense at you know at TR East. Um, I mean, for you guys, for Declan Jai, is that kind of the takeaway here that they kind of found all their options on a night when East just wasn't playing well yeah i think um i mean it was, I, obviously this offense runs through east i mean that's kind of how it's been and on a night where she clearly couldn't shoot it it's big that someone like tarana gary stepped up she was someone that was kind of hot and cold last year you didn't know what you were going to get from her night in night out on the offensive side and for her to come in and uh even when she didn't make that many three points she's still able to get 17 points she found other ways to score and tristan taylor too she had a rough game in the opener and came in 10.7 assists. I think she was really big too. That's someone she's someone that needs to step up. And now that Aliyah Nelson's gone, she's the main facilitator of that offense. So seeing her get seven assists, that's really big. But uh, I I think the main takeaway is that people came in when Tara East wasn't really efficient. Well it's big too to get that production out of the front court because you think about it last year, two of their biggest weapons were Rain Tucker and NS Piper. And obviously they're no longer in the program. They both went to different AAC schools. So then you talk about somebody like Anissa Rivera, who hasn't played basketball in a year, you know, and, and took that time off and is now back and is slowly getting adjusted. Last night kind of looked like her breakout night, at least for the season, started to play well coming off the bench. And then you've got Amaya Oliver, who looked really well, really good as well. She's becoming mm-hmm. a solid option. Yeah. We heard after that first game, Coach Rich was like, we need our new people to start being aggressive and attacking the rim and doing what they do best and not just deferring to the people that were already here. And that was kind of, it felt like last night was the first time we kind of saw that this season. So um, if they can continue that going forward, especially in this non-conference slate as they're, you know, staring down the barrel, their big five classic, I mean, you know, if they can look good against these tough Philadelphia women's teams, I think you feel really confident about this team going forward. But um, I mean, the moral of the story is 
your best player has to play better than what she's done in these first two games. And yeah. um, they need TREs to be more aggressive. Definitely. Uh, so, yeah, the Owls are 1-1 one and one now. They'll play at VCU Friday night. The Rams are 2-0 and after some comfortable wins over Maryland, Eastern Shore, and Howard. This will be Temple's second A-10 opponent. Of course, they lost to the preseason favorite and returning conference champion in, uh, in Richmond in the opener. VCU was picked to finish fifth in the A-10. If you put any weight into the preseason polls... All right, let's turn our attention to Cam Wallace and Cam Miles, who signed their national letters of intent on Wednesday, November 13th, as we're recording this, uh, as part of Temple's 2025 class. So Cam Wallace scored 27 points in West Town's opener to help them beat the Phelps school. So his season's already off to a good start. Uh, had 15 of those 27 points in the second half. Again, if, if you listen to this podcast and you're a big Temple fan, you know all about him at this point. He's a four-star recruit, ranked by rivals at 120th overall in the 2025 class. And as we said before, an important pickup for Temple, considering he's one of the players that Adam Fisher and his staff prioritized from day one since getting that job. And then Cam Miles at IMG has put up some really impressive numbers so far as a post-grad player. He's averaging 26 points. 6.6 assists, 6.6 assists, excuse me, and 4.3 steals to his first three games. Had a chance to catch up with Cam Wallace earlier today, signing his national letter of intent around 5.30 or 6 p.m., I think, at the West Town School. And uh, uh, had a chance to talk to Cam just about signing, what it means to sign with Temple. And uh, he sees this as another important step forward, as you'll hear here. It's just kind of a cool story where, like, he really, you know, we talk a lot about how tough it is for programs like Temple and Nova and St. Joe's and Penn and LaSalle to keep good local players home. And here's a guy who really just, you'll hear him say here, like it was my dream to stay and, and play at home. Uh, his mom's a Temple grad. So really cool moment for him today. So here's my interview with Cam Wallace from the West Town School who signed with Temple today. I know you you got the decision out of the way in the summer, but What's the signing part like, you know, when you look forward to signing tonight, you know, it's recruitment's a long process and it's been a lot of hard work and growth for you. What is, what's today going to mean to you? What does it mean in the grand scheme of things to finally like sign the national letter of intent and make it official? It just feels like the next step for my, um, for my life really. And I'm just, it's just less stress. Like, thank God, thank God I'm committed. And I'm just blessed to have an amazing temple staff um, want me to go there. And I just can't wait to sign this letter later tonight. I'm sure you got a ton of feedback from your family and your friends when you verbally committed. What's it like leading up to it now? Because again, it's it's a journey that you experience with your parents, with your teammates, with AAU coaches. What are they, what kind of just feedback and love are they kind of sending your way through this process today? Um, they're just saying it's your day. Um, your day it's today's all about you and how happy um, and proud my family is. You had a great summer, even just from the summer until the opener. You know, where do you feel like you've gotten better? What have you What have you worked on? Uh, my shooting and just, I've been in the gym, I would say, every day. Two hours, just doing in-game things, in-game situations, um, you know, plays and sets I can go off of. And I think that's really just helped me in-game because I practiced the exact situation yeah. in-game and I, I succeeded I want to, I'm going to get out to a couple of your games this year. I haven't seen you yet in person, but even just, I know highlights are what they are, but just even just going off of highlights, you look like you're also going through that natural progression of looking even just more confident and more decisive in terms of like getting to the rim and distributing. Is that a fair assessment of your game? You just, you, you look, I feel like you were confident before, but it looks like you've even like taken a step up in that area too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just think it's the work I've put in. Like, if you put in the work, you won't be nervous. Um, you just know God has your back and your work shows for itself. And that's where I think more confidence has come from um, this year. It's early for you guys. It's early for Temple, but Temple's 3-0 and right now. And mm -hmm. and they're doing it without a couple key pieces. They're still going to be without Lynn for six more games. And Elijah Gray has been in concussion protocol. But, you know, they beat a pretty good Drexel team last night. They're going to be 3-0 and heading up to to BC Friday, which what are just your thoughts on how they've started? I think it's awesome. Um, and it's, it's also, it's not, it's not even just the seniors, it's the freshmen. I'm um, Dylan, Baba, Aiden, all those guys are succeeding. And I think I could do that as well. And it's amazing to see how coach, you know, uses his freshmen. And that's definitely what I want to do. Um, that, I definitely want to play and all that stuff. That's always kind of been part of his message, right? Like if you're a freshman and you're ready to play, 
you're going to play. It's not just like this like seniority based system, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what I love. That's what I definitely one of the main reasons why I wanted to come play for Coach Fish. How much have you had a chance to obviously you've got your own schedule and your own games. How much have you had a chance to actually just watch the games and kind of study what they're doing? Mostly like every every well, I watched a little little bit of the first game. Couldn't watch the second game and I watched a little bit of third game um, last night. And um, I just think it's awesome. Like, it's just it's just so surreal. Like, I'm actually going to be there next year. That, that could be me. Once you get through today and you sign your letter and you have your fun, is it, you know, obviously you're going to stay in touch with the coaches and, and the current mm-hmm. players. It seems like you have a close relationship. Does it allow you to just really kind of say, like, now I'm, I can really, really, really lock in on this senior season at West Town, we're playing an elite schedule. Is it kind of fun to just, not that you weren't concentrating on that before, but is it kind of like another thing you can get out of the way and say, now nah, I can really lock in on my senior season? Yeah, definitely. And um, I just want to prove everyone to, I'm the best, or like Coach Fish knows what he's talking about by picking me up. And I just think we could literally go undefeated this season. And that's what I want to do. I'm going to stay final. We talked about this when you committed for years and years and years and things have obviously changed with the the portal and and nil but everybody is so hypercritical of like if if temple can't keep a player home or if nova can't keep a player home or lasalle st joe's so on and so forth you are a player that that fish and his staff prioritized from day one as soon as they got the job does it mean a little extra to you to say like hey i'm part of the team's three and oh now and they've got a mix of local guys and portal guys i'm part of the next wave that's coming in as like a like one of the top players, not just at, like in the area in the country. That's coming in and kind of setting that tone, like a local guy that's staying home. How much does that mean to you now that you're going to be signing today? No, it means it means like it just means everything. It's like kind of something I want to I dreamed of, just playing for my hometown, and especially because my mom um, went to Temple. Yeah. it's just you know seeing her see me play uh, for her alumni just makes me happy Mm -hmm. and um i can't i just can't wait man can't wait and especially like with my official visit i hung out with um dylan baba aiden all those guys i just feel like more connected um with the team as well when they win and i'm just i'm more happy tell me about cam miles i know you guys aren't playing in the same team in the same state but down at IMG, they're playing a similar, like, you know, no no off nights for, for either one of you guys. And he's already put up some really good numbers and, you know, can play on the ball, off the ball, kind of like, like you. What, what's your relationship been like with him so far? How much of a chance do you guys get to communicate and stay in touch? I've been in a group chat with him and Coach Afish. We've texted in there a little bit, but that's really all. I've seen his um, IG and all that, and I, I know he can play. Um, I know... Um, all those Under Armour circuits, Adidas mm-hmm. circuits. I know you got to be good to play on those. So I think he's, I think he's a good ball player. What's one thing that you're looking forward to, in terms of again, like you're a very well-rounded player. Is there something that you're really locked in on as a player? You've got good pieces around you, where like you're really locked in on one thing, whether it's your ball handling or whether it's your shooting. I know ideally you want to get good in all facets, but is there one thing that yeah. you're kind of obsessed with in your mind in terms of getting better with in terms of your game? Um, definitely my pull up, my mid range and three ball, um, just off the catch or off the dribble. That's really what I want to focus on this year mm-hmm. or the season to show people I can shoot and you have to come out to guard me. Mm-hmm. It's just I'm not just a slasher. For people who might be hearing about this for the first time, you interact a lot with with Bobby Jordan with Adam Fisher. What was it again? You had options. You you, you had other schools in the mix. What was it about the Temple staff that made you want to stay home and say, this is where I want to go? Um, they texted me every day. Um, they showed love, to not, only, not only to me, but to my family. Um, mm-hmm. They called my dad, they called my mom, asked them how they were doing. And I just, I really appreciate that. Um, it's not even like, you don't got to just show me love, you got to show my family love. Yeah. And that's exactly what they did. All right. Well, we're hoping to get over to a couple of Cam's games this season to just kind of bring you more insight into his game. Uh, another person who can bring you insight into his game and into Cam Miles' game is, of course, Temple assistant coach Bobby Jordan. He used to coach at IMG. Bobby's a former Drexel point guard, of course, a, a member of Adam Fisher's staff and was the lead recruiter on Cam Wallace and uh, had the chance to talk to Bobby about both these guys. Again, two guards that are important pieces for Temple's future. So uh, we'll play this interview for you. This is my conversation with Bobby Jordan talking about both these players. Uh, 
how they've improved, kind of a little bit about their recruitments and and why Temple got involved with them and and what Owls fans can expect from them in the future. You got both cams signing, Cam Wallace, Cam Miles. What what can you tell us about? We'll start with Cam Wallace. I mean, you you were involved with both their recruitments, but Cam Wallace, local guy, West Town guy, one of the guys that you guys prioritized as soon as you got the job here. What can you tell people about? You know what you guys are getting next year. Yeah, I mean, you know, we when we first got the job, really prioritized that 2025 class. Cam was a local guy, um, you know, that we loved from the beginning. Uh, you know, followed him all over from AAU with Philly Pride to West Town. Um, his mom is an alum of Temple, um, which is great to hear. You know, you love to go after guys who have connections to Temple. Um, and connections in the city. Um, you know, he's an unbelievable person, unbelievable player. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting him. What, how big is it for you guys, everybody? I mean, the game has changed so much. Recruiting's changed so much. Everybody says, oh, you got to keep Philly kids home. To keep them home, one of the better players in the area, one of the best players in the city and in, in this area, what does it mean to just keep the Philly guy home? Yeah, I mean, I think throughout my career, like a lot of the stuff I heard was, you know, recruit the guys hard in Philly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think we did that. I think mm-hmm. we showed, you know, from the start, we didn't waver back and forth whether, you know, we wanted them. Uh, you know, we went right in all the way from the start. Um, and I think that was a big thing for, you know, him, his family, um, but also the people around and, you know, the high school coaches, the AAU coaches, they kind of saw that as well. Um, and I know that's been a big thing in the past that, you know, kind of has been used against teams in the city a lot of mm-hmm. times. Um, but I thought we didn't waver at one bit mm-hmm. with him. From the time you guys started recruiting him, he was a good player when you guys started recruiting him, to where he is now, where have you seen his game grow? Yeah, I mean, I think he's uh, become a much better shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their first game this season, you know, saw him hit a bunch of threes off the bounce, um, you know, which he has really, you know, really worked on mm-hmm. uh, throughout the off season. Um, you know, his defense as well. Um, you know, I think he can guard multiple positions. Um, he's really taken ownership to become an, an elite defender. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's something that we're really happy about. And, you know, also he, his versatility. Um, you know, he can play with the ball in his hands. He's a great off-the-ball cutter. Uh, he just scores in different ways. He's one of those guys that, you know, you're watching and you look in the box score and, you know, all of a sudden he has 24 points. Now, it might have not have been allowed 24 points, as most guys say, but, you know, he, he produces every time he's on the court. What about Cam Miles? You guys recruited him hard, too, picked up in the summer. Does the IMG connection there help for you? Yeah, I mean, Coach Huger did an unbelievable job, um, you know, with him and, you know, being down at IMG, knowing some of those people that were still there, you know, while I was there, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that was great to kind of get a chance to go down there and, and see those guys uh, while we were recruiting him, mm-hmm. um, you know, because it's, you know, a big thing of NIO and stuff, and we really dug into relationships, you know, with recruiting, and, you know, that's a, a huge part for him as well, um, you know, just that relationship that we have with IMG Academy. Uh, you know, great staff with Jimmy Carr, um, Brian Nash, who runs their basketball department, Mike Gillian, um, you know, just being connected to those guys and kind of knowing what Cam was going through. And he's, he's going to get a lot of development down there. Um, it's a place where he loves basketball. And if you love basketball, it's a place where, you know, you're going to have no choice. You're going to succeed. You're going to get better uh, physically and on the court as well. Hey, you guys know about all these guys. You have you, you recruit and you have to know all these names. When things really picked up for you guys in the summer, was there a specific game, specific moment where you're like, okay, we got to offer this guy and really kind of go out and find him? Yeah, I mean, I thought we spent a ton of time at the Under Armour circuit, yeah. um, and it's helped us. It's really helped us. Uh, you know, Baba Tunde start, starts yeah. the first three games of the season. He was also playing in the same events as Cam, yeah. uh, Miles, and Cam Wallace at the time. So, you know, it's three guys that we got to see a ton in the summer at those events, and we just kind of really – you know, stuck in there and put all of our eggs in those baskets with that circuit and, you know, really identified those guys, and it's it's produced really well for us. For both these guys, I mean, the, the level of schedule that they're going to be playing, both at, for Cam at West Town and Cam Miles at IMG, I know it sounds like the obvious question, but how much does that help with their development? They both get the good development in those programs, but the schedules they go up against, how yeah, much does that help you guys I, for I, when they get here? I think the preparation is key for them. Um, for any high school guy that's coming up, uh, just going against elite-level players, every day in practice um, 
um, like they do. I think uh, West Town's whole starting five is Division One. Yeah. Um, they, you know, so I think that's going to be big for Cam. And then you know they're playing a very challenging schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he's got to go up against the best all season, uh, not only in this area but outside mm-hmm. the area as well. Um, and then IMG, same thing. I mean, they're going to play the best prep schools in the country. Yeah. Um, I think they're ranked right now as one of the top ten prep schools in the country. Um, we're going to be able to see him actually um, at, on our trip to Mohegan Sun. They're going to be playing up there. Uh, so it's going to be great to get get down and see him uh, on that day we have after uh, the UMass game. Yeah. Uh, to check him out against some high-level guys. But that's the schedule they're going to play all season. Yeah. But Cam Miles, I know, I know like so many different guys can handle the ball now in today's game, but is he a true combo guard? Like, could you guys put him on the ball a lot if you need to? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen him play the point. I've seen him play off the ball. I think he's been successful um, anywhere he's been, uh, you know, put on the court. Um, and that's that's big for us, you know, the versatility that guys have uh, kind of with how we play, um, his shooting ability, his athleticism, um, his ability to make others better. Um, you know, that's kind of what we saw in the recruiting process. He, he's a guy that, you know, can put up 20 plus in a game and he's also a guy kind of right now like you see at IMG he's getting eight and nine assists a game um you know so he can do a multitude of different things on the court all right let's turn our attention over to this temple football team shall we they are uh, uh two and seven no sense in in regurgitating the details of the the 52 to 6 loss to Tulane uh, I don't think we thought there was a chance of them winning this game Tulane's really good. Temple is not. Uh, the only small bright spot is that you saw Trez Worley didn't quit, scored on that nicely executed draw play, 75-yard touchdown in the fourth quarter. Uh, Kyle, you mentioned that the team would have set some dubious records had they not scored. Do you at all remember what you were referring to? Like, how bad was it going to be if they didn't, if they didn't score? But I'll say when I tweeted that I was just kind of talking in the general, this is a bad statistical performance. But then doing my homework, I actually looked at the script this week and saw that you were going to ask that. So I said, crap, I got to look up, see how bad this would have been. So <laughs> wow. my, uh, hero. my hero <laughs> to peel him back the layers of the onion right there. Yeah. If, if he hadn't had that 75 yard touchdown run temple going to that had 71 yards of offense, that would have been the third fewest in program history. And the fewest since Temple had 45 yards against Wisconsin in 2005. That, that 2005 uh, season. That's probably going to be my answer to a mailbag question a little bit later on. Yeah, that was a whole other thing. It also would have been the third shutout of the Stan Drayton era in 33 games. Um, to put that in perspective, the last coach to have any shutout at Temple, not named Stan Drayton, was Al Golden. And the uh, to go back three shutouts would have taken you 193 games. At Temple. So 193 games prior to Sandra, and there were three shutouts, and that would have been the third shutout in 33 games at Temple with Sandra. And so, um, not great is uh, what would happen. So, said, said Therese Worthy um, came in and kind of saved them. And that would have been yeah. the first. I mean, if you're Tulane, you probably hope that you would have shut them out just because the last team to shut out Temple went to the ACC the next year. The team before that to shut out Temple was Duke was already in the ACC. So like they they're, they're they're putting up bad performances against teams that are like clearly a notch above them. Um, and I think Tulane is one of those. Yeah. Another great segue. I mean, sometimes you're just in certain weeks, you're just a well oiled machine, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this, this ain't no hobby. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's this is our real life. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of at the heart of what Stan Drayton was talking about. After that 52 to six loss, he was clearly frustrated. And again, I will keep bringing this up. A lot of this is on the coaches. By no means are we absolving Stan Drayton and the coaching staff of any blame. But but he said it was obvious that Tulane had invested in some players. On Monday, we got more time to talk to him for his weekly press conference. And it was probably one of the more productive and enlightening sessions this year in terms of hearing from him on NIL. And in case you missed it, we're going to play part of that here. And it's really him just talking about like, Hey, we need to level up and you'll hear him say like, listen, I've, I've been waiting to talk about this. I'm well aware that when I talk about NIL and us needing to better to do better with NIL, people are going to, you know, see it as me making excuses and that's fine. But you know, he, he talked very candidly about it. So we're going to play, this is not his entire Monday press conference, but all the, the pieces of it uh, pertaining to NIL. Again, uh, we wrote about this on Monday. If you have not read the story and you're hearing about it for the first time, here's Stan Drayton, a lot of interesting stuff on how he feels about NIL 
at Temple, why they're behind and, and uh, why they need to get serious about it. Stan, after the game, you said that they've, they've invested in some players. <laughs> I was hoping you could just expand upon that. <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, they, you, you know, you, you sit there and you look at that two lane team and uh, the size, the physicality, the, the, the strength. And uh, you look at their roster and where they're pulling guys from. And I uh, had a chance to talk to that head football coach and, you know, talk to him about how they're investing in their players and, you know, the, the result that they're getting because of it. You know, and it started with Fritz. You know, he really started that that roster, and uh, they inherited some good football players, no doubt. But, you know, Tulane's made the commitment, you know, to to invest in, uh, you know, uh, bringing in good players into the program, and and uh, it's definitely showing on the football field. There's no question about it. Are they a benchmark for you guys? Do you see Temple being at that level, or do you see Temple? Well, I, I look at Tulane as being one of the top teams in our, in our conference. I mean, obviously, we I saw Memphis last year, and, you know, uh, SMU was in our conference a year ago, and you look at those teams, and uh, you know, and uh, you know how they're investing into their programs, and you see the product that they're putting on the field. There's definitely a gap there if we if we don't catch up in terms of the investment piece of it. There's no doubt about it, and there's they are setting the standard, uh, the type of body type, the type of football player that is coming into this conference, and uh, we absolutely need to level up to to be competitive with those type of teams for sure. You're talking about NIL or something else? I'm talking NIL. I'm talking collectives. I mean, this is how they're getting their players. And, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And there was an NIL event last week, and Arthur had said, I admitted, like, I, I could have done more. I'm paraphrasing here. He said I could have done more to embrace NIL when I first got here. And I was wondering if you had heard that and what your reaction was, if, you, if you'd heard it, what your thoughts were. Yeah, I heard that. You know, and, you know, here's the deal, right? You know, every day. The, when NIL came into existence, every day has been a different day. It has changed in some kind of a way, right? Everybody's trying to figure it out. You know, uh, some programs can get right into it and, and, and have success, build money, build a pot of money, have a plan to, to, to help players acclimate into their programs financially and things of that sort. We didn't have a president in place. You know, it's hard to make hardcore decisions when you talk in terms of NIL and, 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 and money for your programs when you don't have a president in place, right? So we, we, we kind of had a, a perfect storm not working in our favor um, that did not allow us to get aggressive right away, you know, but uh, having a vision and preparing for what the climate is going to be um, is, is something that we all need to lock in and focus on. And, and maybe that's the, 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 the indicator that he was kind of putting out there. And, you know, but uh, the fact that he put it out there is, is all positive, in my opinion. You know, let's, let's go. <laughs> let's go. This is, this is what it is. This is today's world of college football. And I want this place, and he wants this place to be competitive. Our players want to be competitive when we go against these opponents. And we see the American Conference elevating. Again, Tulane was a clear uh, picture for me. Uh, watching that team roll out there, the, the the size, again, the type of athlete that they had, I'm like, okay, uh, it's time to level up. And if NIL got that program uh, looking the way it is from two years ago, only winning, what, one or two games? What is that right? You know, if that can do that to that program, uh, it can do that to this program. But, uh, you know, people have to be real about it. And, you know, um, I've been very, very quiet, you know, and I've been very uh, reserved in talking about it. You know, because I don't want it to sound like excuses, right? You know, when you're not having a whole lot of success on a football field, the, the words that come out of your mouth, people are paying attention to it. Like, is he going to make an excuse for this and this and that? You know, no, I'm, I'm not that kind of person, you know. Um, but what I am is a, I'm a realist. <laughs> I'm a realist, and this ain't going away, all right? And um, we, we need to be in, in conversation. We need to do something about it. We need to be creative, um, but uh, we definitely need to uh, level our thought process up and, and think forward and, and get into this game because this place deserves it. We can be competitive if we, if we do it right. If you're involved in those conversations in the future, do you look at, you go to people and say, look at what we got and we had to get a guy like Therese Worthy or we've gone overseas to get like a Dago Ebert who's contributed right away or Evan Simon just needed a place to click here. Are those some of the examples where you say, we can do this here, imagine what we could do with a little bit more. There's no question, right? You know, the, you know. Here, here's the deal, right? 
when they talk in terms of business and, you know, hey, I'm going to start up a business, I want to start or whatever, what's the number one thing? Location, 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 right? Everybody tries to find the prime location. Well, so a Tulane, for example, you know, who sits in New Orleans, all right, and uh, in a position where they can get any kickback uh, from an from a LSU, you know, or any kickback from, you know, a Texas or a Texas A&M. All right. On top of they're already primarily recruiting Louisiana and Texas, which is plentiful of talent. You know, I mean, there is plenty of talent in that area. They don't have to go far to attract a kid that's going to be interested in a Temple, uh, a, a, a Tulane education and a Tulane opportunity to play football. You know, so they're prime. They're in a prime spot. You know, and I look at Temple that way. You know, uh, there can be, you know, a local kid that went to Penn State and didn't quite work out for them or or a pit that didn't quite work out or a Maryland or a Rutgers or a, we, we sit in a hotbed of talent. The DMV, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio has produced a bunch of football players over the years. All right. And so if if. NIL collectives and, you know, portal are, are going to provide opportunities for those kids uh, to go find an opportunity to have success on the football field, a good experience on the football field, then why shouldn't Temple be available for them? I mean, we got a great education. We sit in the, in the perfect spot. You know, we have direct flights in and out of Philadelphia, Philadelphia every single day. You know, we, we, we have you know, a, a, a unbelievable venue that we play in in the Eagle Stadium. We, we have it all. You know, we just need that one little piece to help us get over the hump, and, and that's it. This place can blow up. There's no doubt about it. In the recruiting process, I mean, how many times have you talked to a kid that, you know, loved the staff, loved the school, loved everything about it, but maybe you lost because of, you know, somebody else offered It's happened. It's happened. And, and you know, and, and it happens – it happens with the fight now. We're fighting the kid, you know, kids, when they come to Temple, they see the opportunity, uh, they see the education, they see the network opportunities here, and they want to be here. The kids, once they're here, they love it here, right? You know, but yeah, if it's, if it's you know, uh, mono a mono, they feel the same way about another school, but that school's finding a way to kind of take care of them and create a better experience that way in today's climate, then yeah, we've lost quite a few kids that way. There's no question about it. Are you losing to like these bigger schools like the Penn State's? Like I'm losing to the people I'm competing against. I'm losing to American Conference uh, teams. I'm losing them to um, sometimes even lower conference teams. You know, you know we're we're losing them. Not losing all of them. You know, there are some guys that are out there who, you know, that's not their number one thing. That's not what they are. You know, motivated by you know they're motivated by the opportunity to play, and they look at our rosters and see maybe an opportunity to play, and maybe that's more important to them than money. That's that's kind of the mindset that we see a lot of times from our portal kids. You know, uh, people who are coming down from South Carolina, people coming down from Florida. You know, guys on our team that have come down from Rutgers. You know, they're walking away from NIL deals, saying, "Hey, you know, I, I don't need that. It's, it's overrated and." You know, uh, I just want an opportunity to play, you know. But when you sit there and you see teams that have built their programs around that, this made it a part of the, the process, which is if you're going to remain competitive in college football, you have to make it a part of the process. You have to tier it. You have to come up with a, a real system just like no different than uh, free agency in, in, in the NFL. No different. It is no different. You tier it, you got your top starters, you got your uh, significant backups and things of that sort, and you have it slot, uh, slotted for what, their, what money they type, type of money that they get. And uh, they just build their program around it. There's no uh, confusion from the players nor the coaches. They kind of settle into their tier and they play. And, uh, you know, whether they earn it the next year or not, this is, it's on the level of performance. It's based on performance. It's based on, you know, if they're compliant to their programs or not. And, uh, you know, but the teams that are doing that are, <laughs> they're building up something special. And I see it. I see it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've been quiet, but this place can do it. We just need to just be creative about it. And, uh, again, just be real about it and see where we are, assess it, it's okay. Um, and uh, go about attacking it the right way. Guys, we'll talk about this a ton in the mailbag in, in a few minutes 
anything you guys want to say in response to that to counter it I, I pretty pretty straightforward can't really argue with any of it again i think the coaches have made plenty of mistakes they they are what they are they're they've they're coming off a two, three, and nine seasons. They're two and seven. I'll mention this a lot over the next 10 minutes or so. I'm not comparing Stan Drayton to Vince Lombardi here, but man made some valid points in, in my opinion. I mean, I think I said this to you when we walked out, but it felt like this has been something that's kind of been brewing for oh, a little it bit. Certainly has. Like it, yeah. it like they like there has been times where like it's been hinted at or like said like in passing, but this is like the first time where it felt like like it felt like when he when he you when you asked that that first question, it felt like he was finally ready to just let it all out and say it candidly. And I think, like you mentioned, he's made some very valid points and things that we have specifically been saying for a long time now, specifically too. So, I mean, I, I think it needed to be said, and I think you said it as best as he could. The timing's interesting to me. When he was first after the game, I went when. Drayton said uh, they totally invested in some players, and it's obvious in that. I honestly thought that was as far as he was as close as he was going to get to touching the wire. And then, you know, 48 hours, 36 hours later, he came out and just spews everything. The timing is interesting to me because I don't think it's a big secret that Stan Drayton's like seat is warm, right? Like, this isn't day one. I came in here. I know we're going up against NIL. NIL has been a thing for three years now. The entire the entire duration of the Sandrine era, and I has been a thing, and we wait till game 33 to have a call for help to say, hey, look, this program needs an IL to compete with these people. That's interesting to me. Um, the skeptic in me or the cynic in me thinks that it's a little bit of a, I want to put this out there in case um, it's kind of like in in Moneyball where Art, Art, uh, Art House says, like, I need to be able to interview off of this performance like i need to be able to put that out there this is why things didn't work out at temple i don't think it's an excuse i did see people on social media or on our boards or on facebook groups talk it like basically respond to it the way the sandra and thought they were going to respond to it which is oh he's just making excuses and he can't coach it's the reality of the situation but the timing is just very interesting to me i don't know what comes out of this to help stan drayton is what i'll say yeah well we will talk a lot more about it in the mailbag, uh, just some quick stuff to get to ahead of Saturday's game. So now Temple takes on another group of owls in Florida Atlantic. They are coming to the link on Saturday. This is a game that Temple could and should win. I'm going to predict them to beat them despite everything that's going on. This is a bad FAU team that's uh, made some recent coaching changes. Uh, just a couple injury updates. Grayson Maines is doubtful this week for sure. Stan Drayton said, uh, tough break for them at center. He'd start every game at center. He got carted off the field on Saturday. Uh, if he's doubtful this week for sure, hey, I mean, we'll 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 keep checking in. But that sounds to me like you know, with with three games left, you might be seeing Chris Smith at at, at center for the foreseeable future, and then Wisdom Quarshi would be. Backing him up there. Dante Wright is probable this week. Stan Drayton said there's a good chance he's going to play, is what Stan Drayton said. Uh, again, meanwhile, Stan's former boss, Tom Herman, announced on Sunday that he's fired his defensive coordinator and linebackers coach, Rock Bell Tony, Bell and Tony. And he also fired his offensive line coach, Ed Warner, after Warner expressed uh, interest in leaving after the season. So some drama what a going fall on. From Grace. Uh, Ed Warner was when he was the offensive coordinator at. Uh, Ohio State was mentioned as a potential replacement for Rule when yeah. Rule was the Baylor. And now he was the offensive line coach at FAU eight years yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. Eesh. Weird business. So yeah. yeah, FAU's two and seven. They have not won a conference game yet. They beat FIU, they beat Wagner, which is an FCS program. Uh UConn's a common opponent for both these teams. Uh, UConn blew them out 48 to 14. They've uh, FAU's lost four in a row. They've lost nine straight conference games. That's tied with Mississippi State for the second longest active conference losing streak in the nation. Only Kent State has been worse. They've lost 13 in a row in the in the MAC, where MACTION happens. Um, As of last week, uh, Kent State hadn't led for a single minute this season. Oof, geez, behind my every Lord. second of. <laughs> Could always be worse, Temple fans. <laughs> yeah, they used to be. Uh, they used to be a decent MAC program. They used to be the Fighting Julian Edelman's man. They were, yeah, uh, used to be good. Uh, FAU starting quarterback uh, Cam Fancher left last week's game with a shoulder injury. The second quarter didn't come back. Uh, Kaysen Weissman, who's a Colorado transfer, came in as their backup, went 20 of 35 passing for 
188 yards and two touchdowns. Also ran for 41 yards on six carries. So you could see him on Saturday. We want to bang out some quick predictions here before we get to uh, the mailbag. Bang it out. Um, sure. Yeah. I'll, I, I, I like, we've kind of hinted at here. I feel like this is a game that temple absolutely should win. Um, um, I, I don't think it's going to be a pretty win. I think it'll probably be one of those turnover battles where both teams kind of look sloppy. Um, I'm going to go with a 28, 24 temple win. Hmm, I had 28, 20 in my mind. Oh, okay. Yeah. I had 28, 14. I think it's 35 if Dante Wright plays. Kyle, are you bold enough to predict a uh, Temple point total other than 28 points? I'm going to just because in FBS games, this FAU team gives up 465 yards of offense a game. Like they've given up close to 500 in four straight games. I think it's a horrible defense. Um, I'm going to say Temple wins this game 38. 38. Oh, field goal. Oh. 21. I think it's a game that you you feel good about afterwards. I don't think it has any impact whatsoever on uh, the future or non-future of the current situation, but yeah, I think they win this game. If they don't win this game, they're going 2-10. and 10. Let's jump over to the mailbag. As always, Mike Greenspan of Greenspan and Greenspan Injured Lawyers provides us with a weekly tip for staying safe on the road. So here is Mike's tip for this week, and then we will get to the mailbag. Remember that McDonald's hot coffee case from the 1990s where a woman supposedly spilled hot coffee on herself yet got a lot of money from McDonald's? Well, that's not exactly what transpired. But why am I bringing that up here? And that is because a lot of us will drive to and from our destinations and have hot coffee in our cars. You have to make sure that those lids on your containers are secured. Because think about it. Let's assume you're driving. You have to suddenly make a stop. Somebody cuts in front of you, a kid, a ball darts out, something, and you've got to slam on your brakes. If your hot beverage is not properly secured, it's going all over you, and that's not going to be fun. So if you have Heights coffee, you don't have to worry about it, except that might startle you if it comes on you as well. So what's the tip of the week? Make sure that your beverage is secured when you go to work and you're driving and you can enjoy your journey. Thanks once again to Mike Greenspan of Greenspan and Greenspan Injury Lawyers. Let's jump into the mailbag here. A lot of football stuff. A lot of upset fans, which we get. We hear you. A couple of questions here. We'll answer these at once because they are very similar. Off the hook three on Twitter. One of our loyal, loyal listeners, excuse me. Uh, and Temple fan, Al, very similar questions off the hook three. Do some of the latest comments from Arthur Johnson surprise you? In today's world, we need an AD that shows initiative, but it seems he's been reactionary regarding how sports programs are run. Is that how you guys see it? Temple fan, Al, from our message board said, per the Temple News, Arthur Johnson admitted to being slow and reacting to NIL at the NIL education event and that we have to do better. Does this confession mean Temple's leadership at all levels, will now support the NIL movement. Is Arthur saying this now as a reactionary measure to how unwatchable the football team is? So, uh, again, I think we did we talk about this on last week's pod, or no? I think we had recorded before the event. Yeah, we were recording. So, before. the alumni office held an NIL education event at uh, the townhouse in Media uh, on State Street. For our loyal Delco listeners, uh, yeah, Colin Schofield was there for us for the Temple News. And yeah, Arthur Johnson was pretty candid. And he said, now I'm very much paraphrasing here. Um, yeah, he said he was basically implied he was like cautious about NIL. Um, he didn't really take over a good situation when uh, when Pennsylvania introduced its NIL legislation. That is when Brian Dunphy, who is a hell of a basketball coach, but was Temple's acting interim athletic director. Temple had no plan. I, I, I'm not saying that to be snarky. There was just nothing ready. There was a quote. They released a quote from Fran Dunphy. Uh, Penn State was ready. Pitt was ready. Temple was not. So by no means was Arthur Johnson taking over a well-oiled machine. But yeah, he admitted to saying essentially, yeah, I, I could have and, and should have done more. So uh, from off the hook three, do some of the latest comments from Arthur Johnson surprise you? Kyle, I'll start with you. Were you surprised by that? Um, if these comments had been made in November of 2021, you know, a couple weeks after he had taken the job, I would have been like, you know, that's a perfectly fair and valid response. Like, yeah, you didn't hit the ground running, but you know, you're going to figure things out. 
It's been three years since Arthur Johnson's been here, and he's just now vocalizing. Oh, by the way, we got to figure out a plan for NIL, which I was speaking to somebody today. is a little funny, ironic, sad that Temple is vocalizing. They got to figure out NIL when there's all these reports out here about other programs ironing out plans for revenue sharing. Revenue share, yeah. Like, uh, it's like coming to school and being so excited that you got a Pokemon card and all your friends have moved on to girls. Like, you're just late to the party. <laughs> You're like, hey guys, this is awesome. I got this holographic Charizard, and they're like, cool. I'm gonna go talk to Tiffany. Like he's they're just, he's just late to the game. <laughs> I think the Arthur Johnson comments are also kind of in the same vein, maybe as the Stan Drayton comments, where it's like, my the cynic in me goes to like, are you just trying to save yourself? Like, mm -hmm. there's a new administration at Temple coming in. John Fry's been there for twelve days, two weeks. And maybe he's just starting to get it out there, put it out there, vocalize like things are changing. I have a plan. We're going to figure it out. We're going to figure out NIL. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was a little surprising to me just because it's 2024 and not 2021. And it shouldn't take you three years to get a land and realize that NIL is here to stay. Yeah, can't really can't really add anything. No. Other than I wasn't that. at the event. Um, I think the tough fund director, Randy Carl, also spoke. So I think that was part of it. Um, yeah, he paid uh, Randy Carl. Yeah, he did. Yeah, paid paid a compliment to to Andy Carl, who was running the tough on by himself. Um, again, yeah, and just a full disclosure, we've known Andy for a long time. But if Andy and Jenny and their kids were just to pack up and move to to California and just do something different with their lives, Temple would be up a creek with the, without yeah. a paddle. Yeah, Andy, so, would, Andy would never live. In, he would never thrive in California. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, probably not. But we'll see. We'll save that for another episode. Uh, Temple fan Al, does this mean, does this confession mean that Temple's leadership at all levels will now support the NIL movement? Is Arthur saying this now as a reactionary measure to how unwatchable a football team is? Uh, the last part, no, I don't think so. No, no. I mean, they've, I, they have engaged with NIL, but again, there's just, there's been no plan. There's been no strategic plan. Uh, it's, you know, they're, I can't say that they haven't supported it, but there's just been no vision for it, no strategic plan for it. I don't know that it means that they're just uh, supporting the NIL movement. They, I'm sure, would tell you that they have supported it. But again, I think Arthur just said through his own words that, like, they have not done enough. Yeah. So I think it is what it is. Um, two other questions here that we will read uh, together. Again, similar questions. The screen name Father Judge and then JHG722, both from our message board, Father Judge's question. Why is Drayton still coaching this football team, JHG722? How is it remotely possible to keep Drayton after this season? So let's have another round of this, guys. They are two and seven. They just got blown out by Tulane, 52 to six. Their, their record is what it is. The numbers are what they are. We have Stan Drayton talking about NIL and how they need to level up. I think all of these things can be true. The coaches deserve blame. The administration deserves blame. The players deserve blame. This is a classic case of like multiple things can be true at once. Mm -hmm. um, let's banter this around for another week. You know, do you fire him after the season? Do you not fire him after the season? I, I personally think you got to see like if, you know, if they, I, I would venture to guess that the university probably, I guess this is a guess, nothing more. University probably knows whether or not they can foot the bill to pay off the last two years of his contract. Um, if they lose Saturday to a really bad FAU team, uh, look, I think we're all, we're, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say it's not going to help his case. Um, what, what do you guys do? If he, let's say, or I'll give you the scenario. He beats FAU, or let's go this, he wins out. And they... <laughs> And they go and they go five and seven. Um, I mean, I think in that percent. scenario, what's I, that? Then there's a thousand percent chance he's back if it's yeah, five and seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah, that's like, too like, obvious. <laughs> Let's say they go, they beat, they beat FAU, they beat UTSA, and they lose to North Texas. So they go two and one the rest of the way. But you know what? Am I Kyle? Am I splitting hairs here? Do you think it even matters what happens in the last? Well, I think if they lose Saturday, that really puts a... I think if they lose out, it definitely matters, and it makes the yeah. decision kind of for itself. I think yeah. beyond that, you're... If if an athletic director ever came out and vocalized, I fired a coach because he went four, uh, three and seven, uh, three and nine, not four and eight, then 
yeah, I feel like we're splitting hairs a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But what is Kyle, how do you how do you just feel about this in general? Because I think you and I are kind yeah. of on the same page with this. But what, how do you feel about the whole, you know, to because you've got two competing things here where you have a new president coming in and John Fry. Fans yeah. are upset with the football coach. They're upset with the athletic director. How do you how does this all pan out? How do how do you handle this? I don't know how it pans out to be like. Fully, full disclosure to be honest like i've kind of vocalized this before is i was surprised a little surprised when they fired rod carey like legitimately at the time my mentality was just that like arthur johnson had just got on this job is he really going to fire the highest paid member of the university like four and a half weeks into his job and he, to his credit he did and it was the right decision regardless of what happened afterwards that being said i think to win at temple yet that one of two things has to happen either you have to be like a truly great great coach who like really is like forward thinking is creative and knows how to get the most out of temple matt rule did that or the university and the athletic department and everybody else the boosters need to be aligned i think stan drayton stan drayton didn't forget how to coach football people mm -hmm. are out there trying to paint the picture that this guy they just that he's ted lasso that they pulled him out of the midwest and they made him coach a sport that he's never done before mm -hmm. he knows how to coach football I don't think he's a great enough coach to overcome when he's not given like the right tools. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to fire Stan Drayton, that's fine. That's your prerogative. It's not going to matter unless you hit on a coach. Like you just hire a truly revolutionary coach or you get your shit together in every other aspect yeah. where you figure out NIL or you figure out rev sharing or you figure out just different ways to get talent into this team, into this program in either conventional ways like NIL and rev sharing or unconventional ways where like you just find a coach that really like can identify talent to Stan Drain's credit. I think he can identify talent. I think he's, I think they've taken guys that you didn't necessarily see as being productive at this level and really like done well at times. I think they've taken, I think they've recruited fairly well, despite the fact they don't have NIL. The fact that they got Dante Wright, who was a freshman all American to transfer from Colorado state, who, if he wasn't injured, was going to have a thousand yards this year. Mm -hmm. The fact that they got to black, who's probably going to get drafted despite the fact that like he hasn't had the most productive season because of, you know, not being eligible for the first four games and then playing some run heavy teams and things like that. I think he do has done a good job in certain aspects of this. I don't think he's blown him away in every other aspect, but I think it, it's not fair to judge him the same way. You can't compare him to other right, coaches right. that have an NIL ch uh, war chest, or you can't compare him to Rod Carey, who lost mm -hmm. three NIL. Mm -hmm. Like Rod Carey, like was successful with Jeff Collins's players. Then people transferred out. A lot of that's his fault. Then they did not win games and they did not identify talent and pre NIL created the program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just, my, if I was me, I would spend, if I was me, if I was the athletic director, I would spend more time focusing on getting the infrastructure. everything in line and getting yeah. the infrastructure in place and then saying, okay, we fully committed to this. We found a way to, to rile the trees and we got you a legitimate payroll for next year. Go do what you can do and then judge after that. I know that's not what fans want to hear. I know they always want the sexy new thing and they want uh, people to fall on their swords and move on and for there to be a new coach, but... I think I would give San Drayton a chance, but I would also, I, that's contingent on the athletic department figuring things out, which I, I don't, I don't know. Someone will want this job if they fire Stan Drayton. There are only a, a finite amount of college football jobs, college coaching jobs, period. Someone will want it. Someone will fight, scrap and claw. But if nothing changes, if you do not show people what your strategic plan is, and vision is for the athletic department, for the football team, what alternative revenue streams are you finding? What ways are you finding to reach fans, to market the program? I don't know that you're going to get somebody great for this job. Al Golden wanted to come back to Temple in 2005 and said, I, I can, it's a challenge. Al Golden was not facing an IL and the transfer portal. Uh, you know, this is, this is different now. Uh, no experienced big time coach, I think is really going to want this job unless they're like a Rod Carey and they want to just ride into the sunset and they just want to coast. You don't want that guy anyway. Even if it's a young up and coming, like if you feel like you have the next Al Golden, I think in 2024, you're going to have that young up and coming coach. Enough people are going to be in his orbit where they said, nah, 
sit this cycle out? Or do you really want this job? Because you only get one chance to make a first impression. If you fail there, you might not get another chance. So if you don't fix, you know, it's like you think of any cliche you can, if you don't fix the foundation of the house, whatever you do on the roof and like it, it ain't going to matter. Mm -hmm. um, I agree that Stan Drayton has made plenty of mistakes this year, keeping Evan Simon in the army game too long. They are far from infallible, but I agree with Kyle. I don't think he is this. I mean, again, fans are fans. They're going to tee off. He is not as bad a football coach as people make him out to be. If you're not going to figure out, fix your foundation, go hire the CEO of Campbell soup to yeah. be your head coach. Like yeah. that's it. You're going to have to figure out some, some crazy way to get money into this program where in reality, I hate, I vocalized this before. I hate, I hate when universities or billion dollar corporations, all this stuff scry, cry poor. I hate it so much. Like temple. I understand there. You went through a low period. I understand there's a cliff falling off with enrollment, not just you nationwide. That's coming. That's always been coming. I hate this. If you want to play big time football, you need to invest in big time football. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's say it doesn't work out for Stan Drayton. Do you have to, when you're hiring this time around, you know, I don't know, like a lot of the former players say, oh, they should have hired Fran. They should have hired Fran. They should have hired Fran. He would have brought money with me. And maybe I think a lot of former players are willing to donate to like the facility to training table stuff as opposed to NIL. But mm -hmm. Kyle, I'll throw this one back to you real quick. Like, can you go back to, can you go back to, you know, getting the band back together? Like, would you, in addition to needing the infrastructure to be better, in addition to needing more NIL resources, do you go to a person who knows the guts of Temple? Like, do you finally say, we're going to reach out to Ed Foley or we're, or we're going to give like, we're going to try to, we're going to go to a guy like who's got young energy. We're going to say, Colin Thompson, see what you can do here. Or like yeah. another former player, like a Rob, D I, I don't know. Like, I just don't know who you, you go to here. I think Colin would be the first one to tell you that he is not qualified to be an FBS head coach at this moment. Mm -hmm. That would be, that would be quite the move. I hope it happens, Colin. If that, if that's the Add case. him to a staff, like, you know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Things like that are more yeah. viable. Um, I don't know. Like, that's a great question. I don't know. Like, like a Mike Saravo and Ed Foley and Al Golden, like things like that. People are like, know how Temple works. I think that's definitely an advantage, but I don't think it's like a, hey, somebody needs to know where the room with all the gold doubloons are, and that's how we're going to figure this out. Uh, I think it either needs to be an energetic young person that's willing to just scrape and claw and do the uh, golden thing where he was working 130-hour weeks and sleeping in his office and figuring things out for the first couple of years, or it needs to be somebody that comes with established financial connections because like it's i know he didn't get the job but like uh last year two years ago josh pastner when he was interviewing for positions for basketball was openly telling people like i have guys coming that are gonna like back me in an il i bring this with i have connections to these corporations like things like that work um i think those i think it, the ideal unicorn person would be somebody from the area that's worked at temple that also has connections to people that are willing to put an il into the program yeah i don't know if a person like that exists yeah. Like to, uh, to the Fran point, I should they have hired Fran to stand? Maybe. Fran at Temple would not have gotten Kyle McCord. Yep. It wouldn't have happened. Kyle McCord got a lot of NIL money to go to Syracuse. Yeah. Yep. It, the Fran's the whole point of Fran the, the success of Fran Brown's resume is um, is his ability to identify and develop talent into NFL players that people maybe missed on or didn't evaluate whatever what it might be. He's a great recruiter. I don't know if he all of a sudden would have sparked that Temple has a $4 million NIL payroll. Oh, yeah. yeah, he still would have needed the help here. Uh, a few other questions to close us out here. Um, 82 Al from the message board. Same question from two weeks ago. Is this rock bottom yet? This team is overmatched week in and week out. Changes needed and immediately. My same answer from a couple weeks ago. No, I don't think this is rock bottom. This program has seen far worse times again not trying to gaslight fans and tell you that you should be enjoying a two and seven team that that just got its ass kicked but i want to i want to go back to a question somebody asked where like why is stan drayton still coaching yeah and i'm, I'm going to pose this to you guys what would be the benefit of firing stan coach uh stan coach stan coach what would be the benefit of firing stan drayton today like what good comes out of that? none I, what do you do yeah so like if they fired stan drayton after saturday's game 
are you going to say, are you going to tell me that acting head coach Everett Withers suddenly just changed the culture of the program and they beat a crappy FAU team? Like, I, I just don't, I, I don't, I agree with you. wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Chris Simp, 85 from the message board. What are the top five strategies or changes that can help fix Temple football and improve the program's performance? I think we've outlined a couple of them already. Money, <laughs> NIL. Um, Direction. Yeah, I I, st- I, I want to see it. I know I keep saying it every week. What is your strategic plan for athletics? What? Who are your contemporaries? Who are your aspirant programs? What have you identified new alternative revenue sources? Like Kyle said, it's not just about NIL now. It's now about revenue sharing. What is your plan for revenue sharing? Everybody's going to opt in, but it's about how much you opt in. Fig one, another screen name from the message board. If you had to pick one, which football team is the worst in our history? That you just talked about. Yeah. 2005 uh, is up there. I don't know if we need to go back into like the. I think like, I'm not exaggerating. I think they lost 70 to nothing to like Bowling Green. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they were one in 10 and 89. Yeah. I mean, they, they were 0 and 11. Is that their lone winless? I'm oh, sorry, 70 to 7. I don't want to discredit them. They did get seven points, which came off of an Umar Ferguson one yard run. Umar Ferguson. Shout out. About him. Uh, Berkshire Al asking, what's up with uh, what's up with Gray and the concussion protocol? Seems like it's going on longer than expected. I I I think it's just the nature of of a player and a college athlete being in concussion protocol now, where I can only assume that they're erring on the side of caution. So um yeah, fans, I get it. Fans want to see him. He could help with scoring and rebounding. I think we all know that, but I think they're just being doctors and exercising caution yeah, there. Not to, you know, rehash concussions to everybody, but like it's not like an ankle sprain where you can like play through and you're like, okay, maybe I'm at 80% and I'm just going to grind this out. It's you just have to wait until the doctor clears yeah. it. Also, I feel like two weeks is a pretty normal period. So, like, if he does play on Friday, it feels like a pretty like normal timeline so it's not that long ago that they were like locking kids in closets when they had concussions and saying come yeah. out and feel better like it's still yeah. something that they haven't figured out fully how to yeah rehab. um jack orlando is that from the from, from twitter mm-hmm. that's from twitter uh, if the big five pods don't change next year should temple still agree to renew it potentially playing neither st joe's nor villanova in a season of home games never being possible against either should make temple back out in my opinion uh, what do you guys think about this absolutely not that was the most crowded i've seen the leah chorus center in a while and it was drexel like that that was that was a very lively crowd for it was basketball. again i hate to sound like the old guy it's like yeah. 4,500 people yeah I that's my point though. i think that's, you're, that's I think exactly you're, what i'm saying again i'm gonna sound like you can call me a boomer call me whatever the hell you want i think your your expectation level is but no, yeah, no nice but you're crowd. not hearing me. nice crowd compared to what they've had that yeah. is like the, the, the it's a draw is what i'm saying yeah like I'm that not, that is and i'm not saying that they should drop out of 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 the big five situation yeah. i'm just saying like I no i get it. it's yeah. not like yeah. the draw but it yeah. is yeah. right now what this program needs and i like yeah. yeah it would be nice to have a guaranteed game against the saint joe's or a guaranteed game against the villanova but either way mm-hmm. there is excitement around this iteration there is yeah. no reason for this program to drop out of something that Fans are clearly looking forward to more than they're looking forward to the rest of the product. Yeah, I I, I don't disagree um, because I think like what's the alternative mm-hmm. is even if the pods stay the same and the only chance you have a play Nova or St. Joe's if you make you get matched up with them, they're not going to schedule you if you leave. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah, like you're exactly. like it's not like there's this alternative where you're like well you don't opt in and you get to play Villanova and you get to play St. Joe's. They're just not going to schedule you Villanova who's now owned four in the big five since it started, right? Just or owned five, whatever it is. No, um, four, you're right. Is the team that wanted to do this because they didn't want to have to keep scheduling four big five games a year. Well, like they're not going to all of a sudden turn around and be like, okay, now we're okay with scheduling Temple. So yeah, I think it is what it is. It's not an ideal situation. I think I hope the pods mad uh, switch each up. And I, if I had to wager, I say, I would say they do. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think it's just best case scenario right now. Yeah, it's I would have to imagine. I would have to. But so your point, John, sorry, your point, John. I vividly remember like 2012, 2013, 2016, 2018. If they didn't get at least like 8,000 people at the Chorus Center, you're like, this is a bad crowd. Yeah. Like now it's 4,500 is great crowd. Different times. Yeah. yeah. Last question to close us out here. Well, well, well. 
our former staff member and close friend, Rymir Vaughn, who's killing it right now for the Harrisburg Patriot News and Penn Live, doing really, really well out there. Miss you, buddy. Appreciate the question. Favorite slash most impressive individual performance you've witnessed from a Temple athlete from any sport? I love this question. Oh, I don't know. Does anyone else have one? I'm still, I'm still thinking. Yeah, I've got, two, I've got two. Yeah, a few. Go ahead, Kyle. What do you have? I'll. I want to see if I, I'm going to hone it. I'm going to hone it on one. You're going to get. I want to see if I can get what what you're what, what I think you're thinking of. I I think you're probably thinking of what my second or third one is. I'm mm-hmm. going to say my first one just from sheer dominance. Montel Harris against uh, Army. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Rushed for what 300 yards, seven touchdowns, like just destroyed. I vividly remember being in the press box up at West Point. Asking out loud, what's the most yards that somebody's ever rushed for against Army or something like that? And an Army official scoffing at me, being like, don't worry about it, it's not going to happen. And then he just destroys the record. He went from like, he became an all conference player just based on one game. Like, like 40% of his stats came from one game, and he was a first team All Big East selection. Did he break that. Tony Dorsett's record, or was it Matt Brown who did that? Wasn't it Tony Dorsett who would who had set a West Point record for like most rushing yards against Army? Well, Montel, it, it was Montel Harris because he rushed for three hundred. I want to say three fifty one is mm-hmm. what my memory is telling me. And in two thousand twelve, this is a guy who also Steve Adazio made him come and try out to join the team. He made him come to a camp to show that his knee was still okay. Mm-hmm. Rushed for thirty six times for three hundred fifty one yards and seven touchdowns yeah. against Army. Yeah. Um, That's the- on the basketball side, I wasn't there in person. You, you could think of Lynn Greer's 47-point game at Wisconsin. Um, that's a great question. Um, I, my basketball one is more recent than that. What are you thinking? I'm thinking just like from things I saw, I want to say – Either Deontay Christmas against Tennessee or Cleef White right. at Syracuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at Madison Square Garden against Syracuse. Yeah, Cleef White against Syracuse. Or even Cleef against Indiana. Like, there's yeah. a lot of Cleef performances. Cleef against Syracuse and then Kyle's favorite press conference of all time. What about you guys, Declan, Johnny, for a more recent, very recent? <sighs> like, the, the one that sticks out to me, just, like, for that I've been there for, um, and I've only really been covering this team for two years is the Villanova game of Caleb battle and Damian Dunn both going off for 20 and like the court storming there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like the one that's like memorable because that's the only ever court storming I've ever been at. But um, I'm struggling to think of like a single individual that just like went off completely. It's kind of sk- uh, skipping my mind. I just think it's funny. It was like one of the first Temple football games I've ever worked when Ed Sadie single-handedly got a coach fired for running yeah. for like 270-something yeah. yards oh, against yeah. USF. Well, it was just cool. like every time he touched the ball, he was gone. And it was so yeah. funny because that had not happened at any point in the season. But Ed Sadie having a good little year at Gardner-Webber. At Gardner-Web. Hey, he, I enjoyed working with him. You know, he was a he was a very nice guy. That game was hilarious though i the other thing i'll I'll add maybe to close us out here and i mean pick pick a perform like pick whether you're talking about tyler matikevich or Hassan reddick in 2015 against against penn state uh, collectively they had 11 sacks i think that was one of the games where uh you know James Franklin might have been like, yeah, 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 I need a new offensive coordinator here. I mean, Phil Snow just coached circles around them. And who was that Juco offensive tackle they have? It was like Paris. Paris, Paris Palmer? Paris something. It might have been, yeah. Not Paris Campbell. But uh, yeah, I mean, like what what Temple did that day to just, uh, not only were they just destroying that, like Paris destroying Palmer, Chris- look at me. Yeah. Off the dome. Like just destroying Christian Hackenberg, but I mean, they had Christian Hackenberg just yelling at his offensive line. I mean, they had, they, Phil Snow just coached circles around them. And between what Matikavish did in that game, what Son Reddick did in that game, that was, that was, also, that game led to 
and try to connect the dots here if you're with me. That game led to Nick Sirianni surviving the 2024 NFL season as head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. How so? That game, season opener, Saquon Barkley, one carry. After that game, they get blown up by Temple. They bury the tape. They go back to the board. They go with Yay. Saquon Barkley the rest of the year. Here we go. Saquon Barkley comes in 2024. Eagles go like 13 to 4. Nick Sirianni stays. There have been some cause and effect relationships between Penn State and Temple. Penn State was blowing out. Uh, I think I've talked to Matt Rule about this. There's that picture of Matt Rule where he was like, he got a half sack against like, uh, uh, who was the backup to Henry Burris? Um, um... uh, Pat Bonner. And Matt's wearing like his neck roll thing behind him. In that game, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Penn State was blowing out Temple and Joe Paterno said, let's try this guy named Curtis Enos at running back. He was a, a linebacker and he went in and just like destroyed him in the second half and that launched Curtis Enos' career. So I thought you were um, going to go with, there was a certain notorious uh, defensive coach at Penn State who was going to accept the Temple job. That's an entirely different thing. What a way to close out the pod this week, Kyle. Thanks so much. <laughs> For that, well, again, a uh, lot of information uh, in this week's pod. Big thank you to Cam Wallace for taking the time to talk, to Bobby Jordan for taking the time to talk. We'll have a lot more for you next week. We'll have more Temple football to talk about, and I'm sure it'll be even angrier if uh, these Temple Owls don't beat those Florida Atlantic Owls. And uh, we'll have more basketball to talk about, more men's hoops, more women's hoops. And uh, we're always here for your mailbag questions as well. So thank you all for joining us for another episode. We'll talk to you soon.